Lucy Hydro, as well as uh, one of the participants at our roundtable discussion earlier. Um, so we've got Paul Simon, who's a registered professional planner in BC, currently working for the city of Revelstoke. He's studied in Ontario and worked in Alberta and British Columbia. And Paul is accustomed to working with diverse communities on a variety of planning projects. His work is uh, focused on working with interdisciplinary teams to solve complex planning problems while leveraging the capacity of community members to provide meaningful input as it relates to land use planning. And for the BC Hydro team, we have Jacqueline Spray, who's currently leading the customer engagement and sales team at BC Hydro. This team's responsible for developing and maintaining strong collaborative relationships with BC Hydro's customers and partners and working with them to provide programs and services that help them achieve their objectives. Jacqueline has over 23 years of experience at BC Hydro, including senior roles in a key account management and distribution design and customer connections. We also have Catherine Middleton, who's a specialist engineer for the distribution standards team at BC Hydro. This team provides standards that are the foundation and building blocks for constructing safe, reliable, and sustainable distribution systems at optimum life cycle cost. Catherine has 20 years of utility experience, mainly with distribution standards. And Ash Jora currently oversees the Lower Mainland Distribution uh, Design Team at BC Hydro. This team provides customer engagement and design services for new connections and infrastructure improvement projects across the region. Ash has 20 years of utility experience spanning roles within the fields of engineering and design and asset management. So with that, um, welcome to the presenters and uh, Paul will be leading us off. So I'll advance slides for Paul and uh, let him take it away here. So you're up, Paul. Uh, thanks, Carl, and thanks for having me here today. And thank you to everyone for attending. I know everyone's probably busily working away on the uh, Housing Accelerator Fund application. Um, so thank you for taking time out of your day to come, and we'll uh, get through some of the some of the interesting stuff when it comes to infrastructure constraints as it relates to gentle density and the pending changes coming from the province. Uh, Carl, I think uh, I think I went forward one slide there. We got one for it. There we go. So to start off today, uh, I was lucky enough to be able to attend the infrastructure roundtable session that was held back in April. And a big shout out to Small Housing as well as Urban Systems for putting that on. It brought together a lot of great people in the field, uh, including some of the folks from BC Hydro that we have today, as well as some provincial staff to try and better understand the infrastructure constraints as it relates to these pending provincial changes for uh, infill that we are going to see and gentle density. So to kind of start off, some of the areas that we looked at and some of the outcomes from that roundtable session, I'll be going through those today. So one of the big ones was gaps in development finance tools. So some of the recommendations that have come out from that roundtable session, uh, one of them for the province and for the municipal finance authority is looking at the per capita borrowing limits without electoral consent for infrastructure related projects for infill housing and specifically increasing that per capita borrowing limit. So right now you're really capped, I believe it's only $50 per person per capita within municipalities and then regional districts are even more constrained for short-term borrowing with $50,000 maximum and then $2 per capita per person. Uh, based on their census data. So looking at how can we increase that without having to go through the long process of getting electoral consent through referendums. For local governments, things that need to be considered include looking at levies or other cost sharing upgrades that benefit multiple properties, things like fire suppression, as well as drainage requirements. Uh, one of the challenges that comes along with this cost sharing, you're trying to bring a bunch of different parties together to play in the same sandbox, which isn't always easy when we're talking the development community. And then one of the other key things for the province is looking at financial tools to allow for contributions that can be applied on a neighborhood or on a block by block basis, rather than on an immediate property frontage basis. So I'm sure lots of folks in the municipal government world that are attending today are aware of some of the constraints that we have as local government to fund needed infrastructure upgrades when we're really limited to looking at the frontage of a subject property. So really expanding those tools and looking at what the opportunities are for municipalities to be able to fund infrastructure with gentle density coming down the pipeline here. Uh, next slide. Oh. So one of the other challenges that we examined in that roundtable session was looking at local government capacity. So no surprise for anyone that's on the call today, capacity in local government is a big challenge. We have 
so many issues that are coming down the pipeline and more and more is being leaned on with local government to try and address some of those challenges. Housing is obviously front and center right now. Infrastructure capacity is a major one that goes hand in hand with housing. So this is something that definitely needs to be looked at further. So some of the recommendations that came out of the round table for the province was to develop a toolkit for plans and processes that integrate land use, infrastructure assessment, and financial planning. So again, I'm sure everyone is well aware that asset management varies significantly from municipality to municipality. Some are much further along in that game than others, but it is a critical piece to making sure that when we have these objectives to increase our housing supply, we actually make sure that we're integrating that uh, infrastructure assessment with our land use planning so that we actually have the appropriate assets and the appropriate infrastructure to enable that housing to come to fruition. And one of the other key things was providing local governments additional financial support to help integrate our land use plans with infrastructure master plans. A lot of municipalities are in the process right now and have been for many years at developing master infrastructure plans, but if they're not linked to our land use plans, then you get that classic divide between planners and engineers that seems to come to fruition quite frequently. And when we have objectives like the gentle density provisions coming from the province, there's the potential to further exasperate those challenges. For local governments, and I know Kelowna has done a really good a job at this objective is looking at areas and utilizing GIS to actually identify those that are at a high likelihood for redevelopment with some further infill development and start to prioritize the infrastructure upgrades within those areas. Um, you know, you need to balance the burden on smaller sites that don't have the same financial capacity to pay for upgrades. One of the big challenges that we're going to, we're seeing, and you know, in a small municipality like Revelstoke, we see it here every day, the infrastructure requirements that are needed to actually facilitate some of this infill development only increase the cost significantly for housing that's coming down the pipeline. So it's how do you balance that while making sure that the general taxpayer isn't gonna be the one that's on the hook for this in the end. Uh, next slide. So senior government funding. This is another big one that was discussed at the roundtable session. So looking at exploring funding at a more significant scale that is more efficient to manage and creating grant funding that links infrastructure related funding to the number of housing units approved by local government. So probably no surprise to anyone from local government on the call today that at times the process for getting funding from senior levels of government can be quite cumbersome and you almost need a staff member who is dedicated to managing grant applications. So how do we make sure that local government is equipped and is provided with funding to deal with infrastructure deficit as a result of changes at the provincial level? while well, ensuring that that cost isn't going to be borne by the local taxpayer. So for local governments, really providing feedback through UBCM as our main engine on making grant applications more streamlined so that the reporting requirements are a little bit more clear and not as cumbersome in terms of administrative capacity to actually uh, go through. Next slide. Thanks, Carl. Sewer system capacity. Uh, in many municipalities, doing infrastructure modeling and looking at your sewer system capacity is a major constraint to supporting sensitive infill development. So for local governments, it's really important to update that sewer system capacity mod modeling to understand what is the current lay of the land as your infrastructure is currently sitting, and how does this impact if we start to see some gentle dens density creep up and in areas and in neighborhoods where it traditionally wasn't anticipated or envisioned, what is the impact on your sewer system as a result of that? For the province, uh, we're looking at some recommendations to expand the powers of local government to initiate sewer system expansions through their approved liquid waste management plans, as well as creating additional funding for sewer infrastructure upgrades and expansions, specifically for housing purposes. So you're seeing a common thread, infrastructure is very expensive, and there needs to be some thought about how municipalities are actually going to pay for this so that you don't push all the cost onto the development and then have the development not be feasible. That's actually not going to achieve the intention of gentle density and increased infill development overall. Uh, next slide. So fire and water protection. This is something that we deal with here in Revelstoke as a small municipality quite frequently. We have lots of areas that are underserviced with respect to water and fire protection where they don't have adequate fire flows. So some of the recommendations to the province 
uh, that we discussed at the roundtable session. We're looking at existing processes and current fire flow requirements for infill housing and looking at best practices to protect life and safety and ensure adequate fire protection. So any planners that are constantly working with their chief building official or senior building officials, it can be a challenge going through an alternate solution process because uh, they are the ones that are essentially assuming liability and making that decision based on sign off from a qualified professional. So we look at having the province consider some guidance through the BC building code to clarify the regulations for specifically the small part nine buildings for water supply for fire protection and trying to get municipalities more comfortable and give them more direction on what those alternative solutions are so that development becomes more feasible throughout a community. And then for local governments, it really is about implementing that and taking advantage of some of those alternate solutions where areas have low fire flow, such as sprinkling, fire separation, as well as on-site cisterns. Uh, next slide. Stormwater. Uh, Stormwater is one that sometimes gets overlooked, so hopefully we have some engineers in the room that will go into that breakout session and be happy to talk about it a little bit more. So one of the key things for the province that came out of this was looking at increasing funding for completion of some integrated stormwater management plans at the local level that would mitigate risk associated with infill development uh, and actually enable municipalities to start looking on a more neighborhood by neighborhood basis at what the allowances for stormwater management actually are so that infill development can be achieved more readily. For local governments, looking at enabling different standards for different areas. So again, this gets back to that traditional mechanism of updating your subdivision and servicing bylaws, development permit area guidelines. And one of the big objectives that you want to ensure you're cognizant of is that you're not penalizing multi-unit development that typically is going to have a larger site coverage on an individual site. And ultimately, if you have requirements that are too onerous and too costly, then the project doesn't become economically viable and it doesn't proceed. So really looking at those regulations and trying to figure out a way that they can enable development rather than pose a roadblock for development. Uh, next slide. And then lastly, and I won't speak too much about this because we have a bunch of folks from BC Hydro that are much better equipped to speak about electrification than I am, uh, but some of the recommendations that came out and some of the constraints that came up with respect to looking at servicing for uh, through BC Hydro is looking at options for the province and local government to place pad mounted transformers on public land to serve infill development and serve multiple units from PMTs placed on private land. This is one of the challenges where sometimes servicing, electrical servicing can be a bit of an afterthought for a developer. And we're trying to figure out a way that we can have this come front and center and not be done on a case by case basis. And that it's done a little bit more comprehensively on a block by block or neighborhood basis. Uh, for BC Hydro, and they can speak more to this certainly, is looking at updates to the existing Pioneer program that would support cost sharing for hydro upgrades completed by developers. And then lastly, for local governments, looking at parking ratios and regulations that consider the need for EV charging to ensure infill sites have adequate parking and charge space available to meet future needs. So it really is trying to be that forward thinking to make sure that your regulations are set up in a way that uh, 10 years from now, we don't look back and say, all the new development wasn't actually equipped with what it's needed to accommodate EV chargers. So I think with that, Carl, we will be passing it off to BC Hydro now and happy to stick around at the end to answer any questions that people have. So thank you. Okay, thanks for the summary, Paul. It was excellent. I guess we are turning things over. Catherine, if you can share your screen. Perfect. All right, you can see the screen. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay. So um, welcome to the BC Hydro Housing Connections uh, presentation or session. Um, so from BC Hydro, uh, like we have myself presenting, Catherine Middleton, uh, we have Ash and Jacqueline who are my co-presenters. Um, so what we're gonna cover today, um, what infrastructure we're gonna, we will need room for to support gentle density and why. Um, we've titled it Distribution 101. Um, I'll be going through that. Then we also will cover careful consideration required for local government policy development related to infrastructure. For example, not allowing overhead transformers and or services may act as a barrier to gentle densification as costs to connect could increase significantly. 
I believe Ash is going to be speaking to this and benefits to allowing space on public land for transformer and other infrastructure installations. So distribution 101. So what I'm what I'm trying to do with with this, I'm going to just kind of give you an overview of the BC Hydro system, um, how we bring electricity to from our dams to our substations. I'm going to focus mainly on the distribution system. Um, the key thing that I kind of want to get out of this uh, or, or relate to you is uh, the equipment and the infrastructure that we need to be able to serve housing and the understanding of why that equipment is there. So hoping I will be successful in that. Um, so this this map here, uh, this is just a high level picture. Um, it's a simplified drawing of the BC hydropower system. Electricity right is produced by water moving through turbines um, right up at the generating station there that you can see. Um, it produces the electricity. The electricity is then moved across the province by our high voltage power lines. Um, as we get to urban areas, we have to uh, we have substations, right? That's a step down that high high voltage electricity to a medium voltage uh, distribution lines. Uh, continuing in in the big in in the big picture of the system here, um, right? The distribution system uh, is a network of wires and equipment that receives power from the transmission system and it delivers power to the end user. So as you can see in the diagram, um, the, dis the distribution substation receives the high voltage electricity from the transmission system. The voltage is transformed to a distribution voltage and directed to the distribution lines where step down transformers lower the voltage to the customer. So I, I understand that there, there there's might be some, uh, like I'm trying to draw a good analogy with something you might be familiar with. Like, so kind of going back, going to like a water and pipe analogy. Um, so if you think like, uh, so to move water from the city reservoir to homes, businesses and factories, right? You need a big pipe with a lot of water pressure. So city water lines are built to handle huge volumes of water and that water moves quickly because of a powerful water pressure. So now imagine hooking up that high volume high volume, high pressure city water pipe directly to your kitchen sink. The faucet would burst as soon as you turn it on um, and you'd have a river gushing in your house. Uh, so to be usable, the water, the water pressure from the main line must be reduced using pressure regulators. Uh, once that water has been reduced, it can be finally used for showers, cleaning dishes, et cetera, uh, without flooding your house. Um, so this is essentially what we're doing when we're moving the, the the voltage from our high voltage transmission lines down to their distribution medium voltage, and then we need to step it down again um, to be able to become a usable voltage uh, to serve customer customer homes. So, so from our distribution system, right? So if we start at the at, at a distribution uh, substation. Um, we're bringing right high voltage in, stepping it down to a distribution medium voltage. Uh, this is where the main, this is the main background bone or feeders that bring elect electricity to urban or rural areas that can serve the customer, right? And this is this is where you're going to see over your overhead transmission lines with the screen boxes. Um, you, you, you know, here's a good picture of um, you know a substation, and just kind of step you through um, how that uh, how we we serve power out from that. Um, this is our substation feeder egress. So in the substation, um, we're, we're bringing that medium voltage out. It's usually underground and it exits the substation and then we'll either continue uh, with an underground feeder or we're gonna go above ground uh, to uh, onto the distribution poles, which you'll see usually coming out of the uh, substation. Um, it, so for the underground distribution lines, typically more urban areas we need to install duct banks for cables and to move uh, to move ele the electricity. This involves excavation, laying down of duct, and installing the cable in the duct. We usually like to pre-plan um, or, or install additional ducts for future development, if at all possible. Um, it, it sometimes, like there, there will be a an existing duct bank in the area, and this is where. Uh, but then we we have some limitations in in if that duct bank is full, or if we can pull additional cable or feeder through that. Uh, here's an example, um, or here's a good picture of a distribution vault. So as part of our underground system, we have um, this. Uh, we we have underground vaults essentially, like big big pieces of concrete boxes that we need to install in, in the ground. Um, so the, we need these vaults typically for 
uh, cable being pulled through the ducts. Like we, we have limitations on the amount of distance that we can actually pull an underground cable before we have to like uh, a stop and, uh, the, and then begin a new pull. If we pull for too long of a distance, um, the forces on that cable will call it, will damage or break it. Um, so this, that's one, that's a consideration we have to put in. Okay, and then so from from the substation, right? So we've we've exited the ground or the we've exited the sub substation underground. Now we usually have to come up onto a pole um, to continue overhead. Um, this is called a terminal pole. So you can see, um, you know, like you, you can see the yellow line there, the the wires coming up um, from underground, and you know, here's the start of our overhead pole line. And you probably very familiar with the overhead uh, pole lines. You should probably see this everywhere. Um, so for an overhead pole line, the we've got the pole, we've got the cross arm, we have primary the primary wires at the top. Uh, we also have a secondary voltage um, which uh, down below, and then we also have uh, telecommunications on that pole line. Okay, so this is you know coming down to our. Uh, going back to the map here, we've got a different service levels for customers with three phase loads, typically commercial and industrial and single phase loads, uh, typically housing and residential. Uh, whether they are fed from an overhead line or the underground will typically depend on what's already existing in the area. So here is an example of a three phase service. Uh, you can see them on the pole. We have uh, uh, three transformers and service drop going to a three-phase customer. Here is another example of a three-phase service for a commercial customer. Uh, this one you can see is going to is going underground from the pole. Um, so you've got the three can three tra three phase transformers on there, the three cans on there, but the certain instead of the service drop is going uh, underground. So and just, I wanted to kind of bring to your attention here, um, notice that the transformers are located fairly close to the customer building uh, that their service, they're serving. Uh, we can't have long service feeds due to a voltage drop. Uh, we're obligated by national standards to provide a certain voltage level or a certain like quality of power um, at the utilization point um, for the customer when it comes into a building. So, and if we, if we move the transformer further away from the building, for example, um, like down the street, we may not be able to provide the level of service that we're we're obligated to and mandated to by these national standards, and this is going to cause um, problems for the customers and their loads um, and not being able to feed feed them correctly. Um, so then, getting into uh, single phase services, right? And this is typically what you're going to see uh, for residential homes. So here. Um, for residential customers, they're, fa they're fed from what we call single phase services, uh, a single phase service instead of three phase transformers, right? So instead of like you saw in the previous pictures, you saw three, three cans on that pole. Here you just see a single one. So, uh, so from that transformer and you can see um, the, on the middle line there, uh, there, there's service wires, um, and, and from there you can see that we're feeding two houses from that one transformer. So I should mention again that there's a limitation to how many customers or uh, houses a single transformer can supply based on customer load and the size of the transformer and how far away that transformer and secondary um, wire can run uh, before we start run running into those voltage drop issues. We also have here, um, we can also have an underground system. Um, uh, so we have feeders that provide underground service to commercial th uh, three phase customers and residential single phase customers. So for the overhead um, system, uh, we needed space for poles and the transformers were located on the poles. Uh, and, and we have service drops. Um, our underground systems needs duct banks and bolts, which you saw earlier in the presentation, um, as well as transformers and service cable to supply those customers. I've got here an example of a three-phase service uh, coming from an overhead line um, to an underground transformer uh, or a pad mount transformer. 
Uh, before the transformers right, were located on the pole, here this transformer, that green box is located um, beside the pole or, or in a location uh, close to where it's going to be serving the load. Um, and so the service for this, for, for this building, it's a high-rise high building, um, it's being fed from this transformer. Here's an example of a residential area. Um, so here you can see we've got a transformer, a low, a low profile transformer, what we call an LPT, and it's servicing um, two houses. Like you can see that it's located on the lot line. Um, and you can see that it, it's going to the customer panels. Uh, so, and it, you can also see there's a, a line going down the sidewalk, right? So we need, so that that transformer needs to be supplied um, by our, our our primary or our underground cables, and this this so this all has to be built into the subdivision to supply that transformer, and that's like it just kind of going back to that duct bank and that vault air earlier. Like those will be like located throughout um, to be as part of our underground system. So a key consideration to planning a subdivision or putting four to six units on a single family dwelling um, lot, for example, is that we need to make sure that there's adequate, adequate capacity and physical space is built in and considered. So every piece of equipment on our distribution system has a place and a location. Uh, it's not possible to have uh, like a transformer, as I mentioned earlier, placed some distance away, feeding multiple houses as we need to consider our voltage drop, um, the, the uh, the size of the transformer that we have um, and delivering a usable voltage uh, or power to the customer as dictated by national standards. Okay, and then I guess I will pass this on to Ash. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, so yeah, when it comes to just overall concept from BC Hydro and making grid connections easier, we have a lot of work underway to improve our speed of service and ultimately cost certainty for our customers, which is one big thing we've heard from our, um, our customer groups. And so there's really four key areas that we're looking at in terms of, of these improvements. So the first one is around planning. And so that's really all about how we kind of build out and, and build the needs of our system capacity to meet the growing needs of things like housing and small connection um, and small housing but also just this overall shift to clean energy, which we know is a, is a large, um, obviously, demand and, and increase to our system as well. Um, the second piece is just the people and processes. So obviously, planning is great, but we, we're going to need the people and the processes to be efficient and um, resourced enough to help deliver on this work. So it's another key priority for us. Um, and then the third one is around our policy. So we do have an electric tariff and a policy that governs how we charge customers for these new connections. And we know that's probably not kept up to date in terms of what we need, what the needs are of today. And so that's another area that we're focusing in on. Um, and then last but not least, there's a lot of customer and local government support that we're gonna need in order to be successful in this endeavor. And I think that's a, a big piece that we're now focusing in on as well. Um, so next slide, Catherine. So on the planning side of things, a ton of work has already gone underway to try to increase kind of that, that build out of system capacity to support, like I said, that, that growing demand on our system. So the first one is just that we've increased our, our capital budgets to $100 million for, for this actual year we're currently in. And that's obviously for all the things that, that Catherine kind of talked about, like new feeders, you know, the build out of our system to, to try to meet those capacity needs. Um, just for context, like $100 million is about three times our typical capital budget for this, um, for this type of work. So it's a substantial increase um, and obviously a substantial amount of work that, that we're, we're looking to deliver on. Um, the second one is just this planning criteria. So again, you know, we need to trigger capital investments and things a lot sooner in order to kind of meet the needs in advance of those kind of new customer connections um, uh, needing service to our system. And so again, for context, like in the past five years, we've, we've actually installed about 35 new feeders. And as Catherine mentioned, that's really the backbone of our electrical system that builds out capacity to an area. So it's the, the big cables, the big duct banks that support those cables, et cetera. And we already have 18 of those feeders just for this coming year already under construction. So again, you can just kind of see the growth and the overall build out that we've already started here. Um, we've advanced a lot of underground egress corridor projects. So as Catherine mentioned, those are kind of like outside of our substation, building out those duct banks, um, you know, the vaults, et cetera. And there's about 130 kilometers of new major underground distribution work currently under construction. 
We're also looking to kind of enhance our uh, demand side management. So these are kind of the customer behaviors in terms of, um, you know, the, the usage of, of uh, electrical, um, electrical services on our system and see how we can kind of smooth that out a bit again to try to increase the capacity available for all these other needs and, and the growth in our, our overall work programs. And then finally, we're advancing voltage conversion work. So a lot of our systems are still 12,000 volts. So those are the circuit kind of voltages. And we're looking to actually increase that to 25,000. So in, in essence, that doubles our system capacity available on those circuits and those feeders, again, to, to meet this overall growth. Uh, next slide, Catherine. Then on the people and processes side of things, we really have kind of four key objectives we're trying to obtain. So the first is that we just want to increase our responsiveness to customers. You know, there's a lot of work coming in and a lot of engagement that happens with customers. And we really want to be able to be be prompt and timely in providing our customers what they need to kind of progress projects and, and answer questions, et cetera, to be successful. And obviously these, um, um, you know, housing and, and other connections. We all obviously have an overall goal of reducing the timelines for these customer connections. Again, leaning out processes and, and making things a lot smoother to, to um, improve those uh, customer connection timelines. We also just as an overall goal, want to increase that overall throughput of the number of connections we deliver on each year. And then finally, we want that customer experience on these, this connection process to obviously be enhanced and, and improved. Next slide, Catherine. So in terms of things that we've already done to improve on these things, we've, we've actually added 50 new positions to our customer connections group. And a lot of these are actually our frontline designer roles. So these are the individuals that are doing the technical design, reviewing the plans, creating the estimates, and issuing this work out to our construction resources to, to make those connections. So again, front, frontline tech resources. Um, we've already created some streamlined processes for less complex work. So these are kind of simple infrastructure upgrades, maybe transformer improvements and other things that also are in essence supporting new customer connections in a, in a much more efficient way. Um, we've created an intake group that's actually uh, providing a lot more front end engagement with our customers in terms of the information we need from them uh, and the requirements in order to progress it into a, an actual design. And so we've got a centralized group that's actually in place right now that's supporting that so that we can actually be prompt and not have this lag of if we're missing something, you know, the customer would, would ideally know right away that, you know, we still need this piece of information in order to progress that, that work. Um, we've also created some specialized teams to focus on specific types of connections. Um, so one ex key example right now is just our overall growth around electric vehicles and the charging infrastructure and, and system infrastructure needed to support that. So we've actually created a specialized team just to focus on that. Um, we're also in process of implementing scheduled communications with customers. So this is providing a bit more um, insight into the, the process and, and timelines around um, those customer connections. So there's a lot more visibility into it and a lot more um, upfront notification to those customers around those timelines. And then finally, a lot more information, or we're looking to provide a lot more information on our external website. So as an example, if we're asking for a, a key document, there's an example or a structure that we can provide out there with a lot more um, easier to consume information for our customers to understand what we need, again, to, to obviously improve that, that efficiency and that customer connection. Next slide, Catherine. Um, and then another key and big area is around our policy. And as I mentioned, this is the, the policy that governs how we charge customers. So section eight of our electric tariff is what, is what um, articulates the kind of the, the, the requirements around these customer costs. Um, we actually haven't done a comprehensive review or update since 2008 to this section of the electric tariff. Um, and any changes or modifications we, we want to make here actually require our um, British Columbia Utilities Commission approval. And over the years, we've heard kind of probably two main concerns, and there, there's others, but these are probably the two biggest ones. The first one was around this cost predictability piece, like, you know, a customer needing a new connection and understanding kind of what, what am I going to anticipate in terms of costs. And we don't really have a, a really great way to provide that cost predictability within our current, um, current tariff. And the other one is this concept of free riders. And I think I saw it earlier in Paul's slide. It's this pioneer policy, but it's really about, you know, this initial customer that needs a connection can ultimately, or in some circumstances, share the brunt of the infrastructure costs required to, to bring out that service to that connection. 
with all subsequent customers ideally benefiting from that, but not obviously having to pay a substantial amount to do that connection. And so obviously we know that that's a, a pain point for many of our customers. And, and so kind of the two key areas that we're looking to try to refine and improve in our, our tariff. Um, next slide, Catherine. So we are doing a substantial amount of work here to try to make some revisions to that extension policy or, or section eight of that electric tariff. So back in May, we actually held some workshops um, with a number of representatives um, representing various customer segments, engineering consultants, um, local governments, to try to understand the issues and potential options that exist in this area. And we'll share this presentation deck afterwards, but there's a link there that will kind of provide you all the various documents and things that were shared in those sessions if you, if you weren't part of it. So based on that um, substantial amount of customer feedback, um, our policy and regulatory group are actually taking that and looking at the various options and, and making some refinements with the plan to re-engage in the fall around another um, workshop and, and updates on the proposals. Um, and then the final step will obviously be for us to take it to the British Columbia Utilities Commission. That schedule is a little bit up in the air at this point, but we are working with our regulatory group to understand what that, what that schedule and timeline looks like. Um, so with that, I'm gonna head over to Jacqueline. Perfect, thanks so much, Ash, really appreciate that. All right, so just really kind of to tie everything together here, um, just talking about priorities and some of the priorities that we understand local government currently sort of have in play, um, very much in, aligned with where BC Hydro can play a role and where BC Hydro's uh, priorities are as well. So obviously really looking at increasing housing supply, but also addressing climate change. And it's, it's gonna be really key that we are able to work collaboratively and really act as partners moving forward to make sure that we're able to support both. So I think Paul did a good job earlier of speaking to the fact that, you know, a lot of local government is constrained from a resource perspective and, and we're no different. We're a highly regulated electrical utility with a mandate to keep our rates low. Uh, and so we are constrained from a resource and a, a funding perspective and really need to make sure that everything that we, every investment that we make, every dollar that we spend, is, is justified uh, to our regulator as well as to our ratepayers. And so I know that we have that commonality between local government and BC Hydro and, and it just makes it that much more critical for us to really work collaboratively and understand how we support one another in moving forward rather than sort of being a barrier to one another or, or working in, in contradiction to what each other is trying to achieve. And we talked actually at the round table about a really good example of a local government who um, passed some policy that uh, restricted the installation of overhead transformers on existing overhead pole infrastructure. And, and completely understand why, you know, looking at aesthetics and looking at potential impact of view of installing a transformer. Um, but this same local government was now is now quite concerned about the costs associated with uh, installing underground transformers to service some of these new gentle density uh, projects. And so a really good uh, example of a place where had we worked collaboratively up front on some of that policy change, we would have been much better positioned to inform that local government of the impacts of limit, limiting that uh, overhead installation sort of, of the infrastructure. And I know Dean mentioned in the chat some of the challenges with converting from overhead to underground. And again, early engagement and collaboration between BC Hydro and local government can really help to sort of pave the way to make sure that any policy that's being introduced um, is being introduced with a full understanding of what those implications may be to supporting some of those priorities, the housing supply and the, um, the climate change and electrification that we need to see. I think we also just really need to think differently. We both, um, both types of organization are, are steeped in a lot of history and um, can sometimes come with some bureaucratic process. So I, I really encourage us in that collaboration and in that work as partners to think differently about how we're doing this work and think differently about how we're partnering and moving forward in ways that can streamline things and can create that efficiency, not only from a a resident or a business or a, a customer perspective, um, but also in that partnership perspective. How do we make things easier for each other and how do we really sort of streamline things so that we can move more quickly and be more agile as we move forward. And I think just the my final sort of piece, um, you know, we're doing some work in a number of different areas, piloting different things. So we're piloting, you know, um, moving forward with installing some works without permits. We're, we're uh, piloting uh, 
this collaborative planning approach where we look at each other's sort of planning information and forecasts to try and ensure that each is sort of ready, either from a policy development perspective or an infrastructure installation perspective to support what we see coming. Um, but from the BC Hydro sort of side of things, we there's over 180 different unique uh, local government groups that we are working with. And so another piece that I think will be really beneficial and, and advantageous for all of us moving forward is if we can develop and create forums wherever possible for us to work across multiple local government groups and really make sure that we are, um, we're sort of introducing a, some broader uh, change or broader ideas or broader innovation rather than working individually with each local government. So we'll be looking to partner um, with, with multiple local, local governments on some of these pieces to see um, where we can really be more impactful. And I think that's it for us. So thanks a lot everyone for taking the time today to chat and we hope to see you and chat more with some of you in the breakout session and then in the subsequent Q&A. Great, thank you very much, Jacqueline and Hydro team. We will have a QA. and a uh, had a great conversation around putting out fire in our session. Hope you all uh, had similar dynamic and uh, intriguing conversations. Uh, we do have folks uh, from a variety of groups of uh, certainly that more than one um, individual can answer questions. Just to reiterate, uh, small housing, Tamara White and myself, BC Hydro, we have the three presenters, Nancy from Urban Systems and uh, Joshua Craig, Jeffrey Leung from uh, Local Government Finance and Municipal Affairs are here and certainly lots of other experts if you wanted to chime in maybe in the chat. Um, I think what we can do is probably open it up uh, to folks to either raise your hand or unmute. Um, there's 40 of us here now, so I think it's probably fine. Uh, we'll be shouting over each other. If your mic doesn't work or you'd prefer to write your question in the chat, please feel free and maybe I'll do a quick scan of the chat to see if there's some unanswered questions in there for now. But um, opening the floor up now, if anybody wants to unmute and ask any of us questions. I saw there was a question from Ken uh, about, does anyone follow Strong Towns? They're a growing group in BC. would like to see more discussion on infrastructure challenges while increasing infill density. Um, we do uh, talk with uh, Norm from Strong Towns uh, often, and we're planning a potential social event in the fall with him. So definitely um, do have that line of communication open. It, they're obviously, if you know of them, very concerned about local government finances as well. So that kind of other part to this discussion is very relevant. Um, so yes, we're we're connected and hope to do some collaborating soon. Jim, I see you've got your hand raised. Feel free to unmute. Yeah, I got a um, it's more of a, a general question for thought. Um, you know, coming out of that sewer um, sewer breakout group, uh, one of the things that really, you know, of course we have, you know, any increase of density or or a large increase in density, unexpected location is is going to cause strain on municipal infrastructure if it wasn't designed for that density. Um, I know in our municipality right now, um, you know, the the biggest constraint or the biggest user of uh, uh, capacity within our network or sanitary network um, comes during wet weather events. Um, and, you know, and that's that's an ongoing program we have that we will for reduction of that wet weather flow. Um, but on the flip side of that, we're also like adding. Um, we're also, you know, limited by some, uh, you know, building code, um, the private plumbing and and things like that, all around the district to upgrade that. We so it's not within our jurisdiction to work on on the private side of uh, with older plumbing or cross connections or things like that. Um, from a, a, a public utility perspective. Um, and then also we're up against, you know, environmental, you know, fines and, and the regional government's, you know, fines and, and uh, requirements to, to, to reduce the sanitary sewer overflows and, and combined sewer overflows and things like that. So just on a, on a, you know, getting capacity to support new, more dense development, you know, if there was a province, uh, provincial, um, you know, some provincial input to help municipalities, uh, you know, address some of the wet weather flows um, and maybe, you know, looking at, you, um, you know, not, 
looking at helping municipalities address that issue it would free up some capacity within uh, you know most municipalities sewer networks so um, just more of a comment than a question but it's uh, I think it's worth uh, I always like to, to put that out there when I have a chance uh, something we come up against pretty pretty often great thanks Jim uh, does any of our panel members want to, to respond to that I see we also have another question in the chat um, but anybody looking kind of at the at weather flow issues or other things that are um, sewer capacity challenges if not uh, thanks uh, for for raising that Jim uh, so the question that uh, we have from Ken in the chat is anyone using AI for proactive modeling um, so maybe Ken, if you want to expand a little bit on on how you think that might be a possibility, I'm familiar with ChatGPT and people plagiarizing and all of that stuff. But using AI for proactive modeling, uh, we had a. Uh, and this is this is going to happen, right? It's happening. The industry is changing. Um, we had an interesting demonstration from a company I saw on LinkedIn called FitTest. They they're mostly for developers, and they can take a piece of land and then start uh, add in all the zoning requirements, parking, et cetera. Um, they are starting to think about the infrastructure requirements, but it's mostly for a developer to figure out if they can build two buildings or one big building. And it was quite interesting to watch them on the fly, really start figuring this out. Um, and I'm sure there's AI tools to start looking at the infrastructure demands of what existing. We also had another Canadian company, ADU Search, where they're actually using GIS to model where uh, laneway houses are most appropriate. Um, but again, we I don't think there's enough talk. And and again, I'm, as a building official, um, I'm, infrastructure is not my thing, but I know it ultimately affects the project. So I'm really thankful this discussion is happening because I think some communities are going to get hit pretty hard when the province does start demanding more uh, housing units or elimination of single family only zoning. Um, but yeah, I, I just thought that AI is, is here and it keeps growing and growing. And so I was just wondering if anybody knew um, if there actually is a Canadian modeling tool out there right now. I'll take a first crack, maybe just at sharing what I'm aware of. I think um, not in a, the AI world, but certainly GIS around development capacity and likelihood of development. Um, I know that City of Kelowna has done a lot of really interesting work uh, with urban systems. So maybe Nancy, if you'd like to share anything like uh, on that topic. And I know that there are a few others who are uh, having things in the works. So if they would like to share themselves, um, I'm not going to point them out yet because I think it's still under wraps, but if they want to share, feel free. Nancy, did you have anything to share about uh, maybe how the city of Kelowna work on modeling would potentially be a, a path forward to AI or other forms of proactive modeling? Sure, Carl. Yeah, we were working, and this is, it worked out really great. I mean, we started out to uh, kind of figure out what we we're going to do. City of Kelowna is looking at like uh, basically pre zoning for thousands of units of infill development, plex development uh, within their urban core neighborhoods. And, you know, it's a huge conversation. How are we going to service this? Um, and there was a lot of sort of apprehension, especially from sort of the infrastructure folks. Uh, and what we started doing is looking at use, utilizing GIS in a number of layers at probability of development, uh, which really changed the conversation. So looking at building age, looking at sort of building depreciation, lot size, and a number of attributes, and then basically scored like these entire neighborhoods of over 10,000 lots as to the probability of redevelopment sort of in a 10 year um, time frame and a 10 to 20 year and beyond. And then it really changed like, okay, so if this is where the probability of development is going to occur, and this is sounds kind of in a way like ADU search, but it's sort of consolidating them into older neighborhoods where the depreciation is there, then it really helped focus that infrastructure question. And then it was like, okay, let's go through all the different types of infrastructure. Okay. Sani is good. We don't, it's sort of like off the table. Um, and then really what we landed on was a, quite a few water issues and fire flow issues. And, and I think you can even see that reflected in, in the discussion paper that's uh, the guidance paper uh, that Small Housing BC has put out. Um, and I think what it does highlight too 
is the discussion is the need, the importance of modeling because the city of Kelowna has, you know, all the modeling in place and we can model um, different types of fire flows and kind of see what the impacts are in these areas. So GIS is an extremely uh, powerful tool and it really helped change the conversation and focus our efforts. And I would say it could lead to good uh, sort of capital planning as well. Um, when you're talking about pre-zoning on a large scale without this in mind, I think it was an overwhelming conversation, but it just made everything so much more tangible. And I think City of Kelowna is definitely happy to share uh, some of the work that we've done and it's good to be hitting uh, council in the coming months too. So, and happy to talk about it if anyone wants to reach out. Thank you, Nat, so much appreciated. I do see that our time is kind of running close to our 1230 stop. Uh, so definitely want to make an opportunity if there's other burning questions. We do have another request of you though, if you can respond to our poll about how you enjoyed the session, uh, but more importantly, if we do further of these, what uh, topics do you think warrant that deep dive? Um, some of them have been suggested here as potential. They're things that certainly we're thinking about. We know they're not the only topic, so if you have the opportunity to select something else. Um, so please do that um, and respond uh, over the next couple of minutes. There's also questions about how you thought uh, the webinar went, whether it was valuable for you. So we definitely want to hear on that front as well to make sure that it's continuing to be um, useful and um, something that you want to come back for. So I'll leave this one open for a little bit uh, while I talk about some of the next steps here. There will be a follow-up email to all participants uh, with some of the resources from today, specifically that uh, guidance paper. So the servicing and infrastructure guide uh, will be distributed. You may also see, see it coming out from other channels, but you'll get it first. Um, and definitely, uh, if you have questions or follow-up comments that you'd like to share, please do relay those back through us. Um, we facilitate the gentle density network, but we're really dependent on your actions and participation to make it really valuable because uh, we certainly benefit from everyone's diverse experiences across the province and, and want to hear what's going on in your communities. I think we've got um, about half who've responded on the poll so far, and we've got a couple of minutes left. So I don't have anything else to, to add for today, but we'll leave the poll running. So thank you if you have uh, participated in that. We won't cut you off quite yet if you're not done, but thank you everyone for, for joining us and for sharing uh, how you feel about how infrastructure might be impacted by gentle density. So thanks and have a great afternoon.